All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final summer school session of 2022. First, I want to thank everyone in attendance, um, both in person and online. This event had the highest registration that ELI has ever had, so very, very excited about that. Um, my name is Arielle King. I am the Environmental Justice Staff Attorney here at ELI. Been here about a year now. Um, yeah, very excited to be able to act as your moderator today. ELI's mission is to make law work for people, places, and the planet in that order. We're working hard to build a set of tools that will help communities receive the legal services they need at no cost provide accessible updates on environmental justice initiatives at the state, local, and federal levels, and offer continuous learning opportunities for practitioners, in-house counsel, law and policymakers, and anyone else who would like to expand their knowledge of environmental justice through the legal lens. We strive to make all of our environmental justice programming free and available to the public, regardless of membership status. And we're always looking for opportunities to partner with organizations to do individual projects and programming. Environmental justice embraces the principle that all people deserve equal access to environmental protection and enforcement, recognizing that this, both historically and currently, often is not the case. And communities that receive the least benefits are experiencing the greatest environmental burdens. And in the United States, these communities are predominantly low income and or black indigenous people of color. Environmental justice is about redistributing those burdens and benefits for the things that we need in our society to function in a more equitable way and limiting the overall impacts of extractive industries to improve the health, safety and well being of all people, but especially those who have been overburdened by pollution emitting sources through historic and current systems. And what a momentous time to be an advocate for environmental justice. We're seeing more developments in law and policy than at any other point in environmental legal history. The federal government is making great strides to advance environmental justice through initiatives like Justice 40, um, which is continuing to advance. But the, the gist of it is that 40% of all of the climate investment benefits um, that are granted by the federal government will be going to communities that are considered disadvantaged or overly burdened by environmental harm. And this comes from Executive Order 14008 that was issued last year, or 20, yes, last year. Um, and in the last year and a half, nearly 15 states have developed their own environmental justice laws to rectify past harm. Today, we have a group of experts that will share their experiences working in the field of environmental justice law and policy. Each presenter will introduce themselves, and then I will go back um, and have each of them spend a few minutes diving into a topic of their choosing. Following these presentations, I'll open up to questions from the audience. For those of you joining us via Zoom, I'd urge you to add all of your questions into the chat as they come up. I have coworkers who are monitoring the chats um, the whole time, so I'll be trying to go back and forth between in-person and virtual questions. Um, so without further ado, in the interest of time, I do want to start introducing our panelists. So first, I will start with Quentin Pear, um, and please introduce yourself, and I would love for you to just share a little bit about your journey in environmental law and environmental justice. Oh, well, thanks, Ariel. I'm very glad to be here today. The, um, I retired uh, since 2015 from the Department of Justice, where I served <clears throat> as a senior trial attorney 35 years um, and was also the environmental justice coordinator for the department. Um, we were last, though, 15 years of my tenure there <clears throat> prior to going. Home to the department uh, for five years of uh, representing GIs and court marshals in Europe, and five years of solo practice uh, representing uh, criminal defendants in DC before being uh, brought into the Department of Justice. Um, I um, served on the federal interagency working group on environmental justice with the federal they have a long name the um in that capacity we brought 
different agencies together to see what we can do to promote environmental justice and to help underserved communities. Um, I sat on, as I said, for uh, well, for about 15 years. I was also the chair of the federal uh, IWG's Native American Task Force, which particularly looked at the intersection of environmental justice and uh, Native American issues, particularly of sovereignty, for about five years. Other than that, oh, Told to speak up. <laughs> um, other than that, I've just been involved in um, I did, I did a, two uh, cycles of work one with the Office of Environmental Justice at EPA and also with the administrator of EPA's office with more Title VI and uh, environmental justice issues. Thank you so much. And next, we'll turn to our panelist who is joining us via Zoom. O'Day, would you love to introduce yourself, please? Sure thing, uh, Errol. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm O'Day Salim. Um, I am an attorney at the National Wildlife Federation, and I also direct the University of Michigan Law School's Environmental Law and Sustainability Clinic. Um, I've been in different roles, uh, mainly clinical roles, um, you know, practicing um, environmental justice for some time, and a lot of the work that I've done um, relates actually to um, utilities, energy utilities, water utilities, um, but also some water quality based uh, environmental justice work. Um, at the law school, I direct the clinic and I also teach the um, environmental justice uh, seminar. Um, I think I'll leave it at that for now, Errol. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next, I'll turn it to you, Carlos. Yeah, great. Uh, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Carlos Garcia. I am currently a federal policy manager for Bloom Energy, uh, which is a manufacturer of solid oxide fuel cells and electrolyzers for hydrogen production and non combustion energy use. Uh, I also lead the company's environmental justice efforts. Um, my, my work history, um, although not as prestigious as yours, sir, I think is, is, is definitely very varied. Um, everything from uh, working at law firms in New York City that focus on uh, water rehabilitation for animal species, uh, shutting down nuclear reactor facilities in and around New York City because of effects on the water specimen, uh, air, soil, water quality, advocacy and education, um, down to Peru with the Peace Corps, and then uh, worked for the Peruvian government as a director of environmental initiatives. Um, and I think that's where I really focused on environmental justice. Um, you know, everything from native tree plants, species reforestation programs, uh, free international lecture series where we got NASA scientists, um, TED Talk speakers, people from um, the Smithsonian Institute to come talk to uh, some of the most poorest communities in Peru and talk about the effects that climate change is happening on them. And, and a, a really big focus on women speakers. And that was actually picked up by the United Nations Women Program um, to be disseminated around uh, South America. And then after that, uh, came back stateside, uh, worked at a university in Cambridge, focused on energy and environmental justice, uh, got my master's and certificate of law at school in Philadelphia. Um, and then uh, it's great to hear about Justice 40 getting some recognition as well. I think if you take a step back as well, uh, a really interesting thing, uh, the organization I work for, always happy to show them out, uh, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, was extremely instrumental in passing the state's, New York State's uh, climate, uh, considered renewable portfolio standard called Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, CLCPA. Um, and NIJA, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, one of the main authors, ensured that 40% of disadvantaged uh, communities get, sorry, that 40% of the benefits uh, of all new spending for the state of New York go to disadvantaged communities, which was then picked up by the Biden administration. So environmental justice, environmental organizations in New York, fighting the good fight for a long time, um, wrote that and that was picked up now federally. Um, uh, and you know, there's still a lot of arguments around what is the benefit, what is the disadvantaged community, um, but that's, uh, I guess for us lawyers, uh, you guys lawyers and, and smarter people to handle. Um, and then uh, now I focus primarily on federal government policy, administrative law, uh, the reconciliation bill that just came out um, last night, 
I think we've all been spending wee hours trying to analyze what it means. Um, that's my kind of day to day, trying to find the intersection um, between uh, good policy and environmental justice. Thank you. Last but not least, I'll turn it over to you, Gwen. Thanks, Ariel. My name is Gwen Keys Fleming. Uh, currently, I serve as a partner and co chair of the environmental practice group at DLA Piper, uh, the US offices. Uh, in terms of my introduction to environmental justice and, and how I came to this work, I owe that uh, to the person to my right, Mr. Quentin Payer. Uh, when I was first hired by Lisa Jackson to be regional administrator in uh, Region 4, which is based out of Atlanta, I was hired at the time at a time that there were several environmental justice issues, including uh, where and how the deposits from the TVA coal ash spill to be uh, disposed of in uh, in EJ in Alabama, and uh, I remember getting a call from Quentin, making sure that I knew and understood uh, all of the, the components of environmental justice and how important it is to ensure that communities have the opportunity to voice their concerns uh, and not just voice those concerns, but be heard, but actually, actually take, are, are taken in response to those statements and concerns. So I was first introduced to environmental justice as my position as a regional administrator. Uh, and I was able to continue the focus, the agency's focus on environmental justice when I became chief of staff for the EPA under Gene McCarthy. At that point, we also worked to ensure that there was a permanent position um, it, recognizing environment justice as an associate administrator position. At that time, we uh, asked Mustafa Ali to be the very first uh, or one of the first folks at that level in the administrator's office to focus on. And I've continued to focus on EJ even in my private sector. Quentin and I currently co chair the American Bar Association's uh, inaugural committee on environmental justice or the environmental justice task force. And so we currently work with 11 other members that represent all different sections of the bar, as well as uh, several frontline communities and uh, tribal interests as we work to advise the bar how to be a part of eradicating the injustice that have occurred in communities for so long. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how this, like I call it, is a multi-level chess uh, strategy that includes not just uh, federal components, but also state, uh, tribal, and local components as well. So we'll have to Thank you so much. Now we're going to start with the short presentations from each of the presenters. Um, so Quinton, I will start with you. Um, the floor is yours to, to share these, whatever you'd like to share um, in terms of environmental justice today. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you a lot for having this seminar. Or, uh, and I have to start off by saying two hours to talk about environmental justice is really not a lot of time. <laughs> I've been teaching environmental justice at Howard University School of Law for the past 18 years, and um, it just keeps evolving and getting more complex. Um, but I must say that one of the most popular courses is environmental justice, so it's a seminar, seminar and uh, just kept growing, which is important. But in the time that we have, that I have. I'd like to give you an introduction to the history of of if I can, on environmental justice. Um, it depends on who you ask when environmental justice starts in this country. Most times people will say it um, comes out of the civil rights movement and the environment movement, which is very true. Um, I maintain that you have to go back to the beginning of the history of this country to understand environmental justice. In fact, you have to go back before that. In fact, I would go take all the way back to 1493, not 1492, but you know, Columbus did that thing. 1493, um, 
On May 4th, Pope Alexander VI of the Roman Catholic Church issues a public decree stating that any land inhabited by people who are not Christians can be quote, discovered, close quote, and then claimed by Christian rulers who have the authority to overthrow, quote, barbarous nations, close quote, and forcibly bring tribal nations, quote, in the faith itself, close quote. The decree not only provides the rationale for Spanish rule over lands discovered by Columbus, uh, but he ultimately provides the pretext for stealing native lands, mandating Christian conversion by European colonizers later via American colonies. Um, it, it goes on basically to show how to give cover, if you will, to Spain and Portugal to enslave people. Um, for me, this is important to notice. It goes all that far back before the Europeans came to the Americas. And to truncate a lot of this history, of course, you had the massive increase of slave trade, going to Africa, stealing people, bringing them to the Americas, principally to South America, then to North America. And um, of course, we have. Uh, in 1619, when slavery was introduced to this country, the first 19 Africans, slaves, bought, sold, beginning of the slave trade in America, which flourished uh, with our founding fathers and um, all the way to the Civil War. Um, this is problematic for me because it, forces us as Americans to look at who we are and what is America. Do we believe in what America is supposed to be? I would remind you that uh, in the Declaration of Independence, those sacred words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, sorry ladies, they forgot about you all about it, are created equal, that they uh, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among them are, and I assert my own head here, the rights to clean air, the right to clean water, and the right to clean the environment. To get uh, past uh, the Civil War, which basically was uh, emancipating the slaves, uh, which simply means they let all of these black folks lose from the bondage, but without money, without land, without food. And then they had to enter the Jim Crow era, which they were basically forced them back into slave like conditions, if you will. But they were able to find, uh, just like they were able to find employment in the armed forces of all places, the Mexican War, Indian War. World War I, World War II, we were able to use the services not always carrying arms, but nonetheless. And so then eventually we come to a point of World War II, and as many people cite the beginnings of, of environmental justice. Now, I guess we should look at the definition of environmental justice. And everything I'm saying here for myself, I would assume that most of us is all online. There's no secrets here. You know, um, if you come to class, you'll find some secrets, but it's, it's this is easily accessible material. Now, EPA uh, adopted a definition of environmental justice, which was fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. I don't think there's anything mysterious about that. 
Um, there is no such thing as a, a golden rule definition of environmental justice. States vary a little bit, but they pretty much have adopted the EPA and the former chief of staff for the administrator might correct me if I'm wrong on that. The, um, some organizations have slightly different such policies, but they all basically encompass these basic elements. Uh, but the road to environmental justice is pretty rocky. And one thing that you, I would like to make sure that uh, to make clear, you cannot look at environmental justice unless you understand structural racism in this country. It ain't pretty, but it's there. And as lawyers, we have to talk about these things. Can't not deal with mythology. And it is a, it is endemic to the whole understanding of this has been a struggle which goes back to the beginning of this country, but it has been uh, even after the uh, emancipation of the black population in this country, federal laws, state laws, social custom have kept the black populations enslaved in one form or another and have ensured the inequalities economically and politically up until this moment in time. So a little bit to the history finally, and that is after World War II, America was the last nation standing. Our industries, we were still making stuff when the rest of East Europe was, the world for that matter was flat. Um, and all of a sudden, um, business was good. Um, states in the South kind of recognized that I mean, most of the industry, industry in the United States at that time was in the North. And the Southern states wanted to get in on the action and they invited um, the business in the industry that was down South. Come on down. We'll give you big tax breaks. We've got cheap labor and land. And industry and business in general responded. Um, about the same time in the 50s and 60s, the environment all of a sudden started becoming important. We started realizing that we were poisoning ourselves. Pesticides, um, um, air, and particularly amongst government uh, researchers, but not just government researchers, started uh, looking at, at um, what we were doing to our environment. And um, I have to really look at note here because I've lost my mind. Oh, Rachel Carson, who um, is a landmark uh, critique of industry and its effects on the environment in her Silent Spring in 1962, which was severely criticized because she lacked scientific credentials. And I might note also she was only a woman. Uh, but she has become the touchstone for the environmental movement in this country and exposing the horrors of the industrial segment of our society. Not only this industrial side, but government as well. And has been a basis for the growth of environmental justice, the environmental movement, and in general, um, the public awareness of the effects of as a substance. Um, so all of a sudden there's this big explosion in uh, government and in legislatures. There is the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Clean Clean Act, anything that was clean, government they were passing laws uh, to clean up the environment. And all of these really exist today, today from the 70s. And there's about a 10 year span when all of these uh, statutes were developed, all to the benefit of all of us. Okay. The, um, about that time, also, you had the development of um, this, well, this interest 
from Americans in general, but in particular, there was a, we started getting notice of communities speaking up and on for themselves, which is a tenant, by the way, of, of, the, uh, of the environmental justice communities. When I say we talk about communities here, we're talking about the poor and people of color. Okay, I'm not talking about Hollywood or the upper side of New York, the west side of New York, the east side of the west side. Of New York. But anyway, you get the idea. We're talking about underserved communities and people that don't really have political power or the economic advantages that really most of us in this room have. And the, uh, mo the modern era of the, the uh, environmental justice movement is kind of pinpointed in um, uh, North Carolina at uh, um, oh, thank you, spotty memory, Warren County, North Carolina, 1982. It was. Um, the state was going to build a hazardous waste facility for industry because with all these laws that started percolating out of government, business would, went to the legislature of North Carolina and said, look, you invited us down here to, uh, to uh, you know, now we've got all of this, uh, these laws and the far as I can't get up all this hazardous waste I've got. I've got all of this material in my park parking lot. I can't put my Cadillac there. What am I going to do with this stuff? Don't worry. We're going to give you the super landfill. And they did. Went out to some place where there were no people in the country and dug a big hole with no line six feet above the ground. Of course, the uh, place which no people happened to be Warren County, on which the majority of the population was African-American. The problem is they didn't even know, they'd never heard of this landfill. They didn't know what was going on because you see nobody in the legislature looked like them. There was no notice to them, even their local papers. It was just the, the poorest county in the state. So on the day of the great ceremony, when they opened up the, the gates for this facility, the community just showed up and protested. In fact, most of them laid down in, in front of these huge dump trucks with PC contaminated soil that was going to be put into this landfill. And um, they were arrested in protest. One of those uh, people who, uh, oh, I don't, you should mention it which is also a particular note to me, was most of the those who were arrested were children. Shades of Selma, Alabama, and the civil rights movement. See, most people forgotten about children's march of the civil rights movement, where they locked up these kids and put them in jail cells, packed them in like sergeants after they've been exposed to water hydrant not high water hydrant, but those big water hoses and uh, having uh, police dogs set upon them. And they put them in jail as young as 10 years old, 10 or 12 years old. 1982, shades of civil rights, the children come to the rescue of their community again. One of those who were arrested who was not a child was the Reverend Walter Fauntleroy, very distinguished and prominent, uh, prominent African American. Uh, minister here in Washington, D.C., who was elected to Congress to represent us in the House of Representatives. But not that we could vote, but that's a tale for another time. But as being a member of Congress, he did have access to the services of, Con of the uh, support staff, particularly the uh, GAO, the General Accountant. And uh, he asked for a report to be done on the de demographics of sites in the Southeast United States where hazardous waste facilities were. 
where those facilities were and their relationship to the to the uh, the dem demographics. Why the Southeast United States? Well, because he was African American, and most the large, overwhelming majority of African Americans in the United States at that time lived in the Southeast in the 70s. The results of that study done, done by the government, the federal government, three out of four of these facilities were found in low-income communities and communities of color. Three out of four. And the overwhelming determinant factor of where you would find them was race. Income was a distant set. Well, this raised a hue and cry throughout academia. Oh, what you're saying, you know, that this is purposely done. This is America. We don't do blah, 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 blah. So in 1987, a very distinguished researcher by the name of Charles Lee and his assistant, Ms. Bernice Miller Travis, both very distinguished environmental justice advocates today. What uh, they were hired by the United Church of Christ and asked to do uh, an updated survey of all 50 states, not just the Southeast United States. Um, and so, with the limited budget they had, they did that. The results of that study three out of four facilities were in communities of color and four communities. And the singular the most important determining factor of where you would find these facilities, again, was race in every state in the nation. 1987. Well, let's move on now. Uh, there can only hit highlights. But, uh, well, I'd like to jump to 2007 when Dr. Bullard, um, uh, I think the University of Texas now, very distinguished researcher uh, and very prominent in the environmental justice movement and as an advocate, written many, many articles, highly regarded. He put together a, a team of distinguished researchers and said, you know what? It's been 20 years since that the United Church of Christ report came out. Maybe we should go back and just revisit it and see what kind of progress has been made. We've got new computers, we've got a lot more money for research, you know, but we've got a bigger stand. The results were not only the same, but worse. And still, the most significant, significant determining factor was race, a distant second was in. Now, I didn't mention that the original United Church of Christ uh, survey when it came out, the, the, the uh, director of uh, the commission on the, uh, social justice of the of the church was. Uh, thank you. I got my helper here. <laughs> Don't get old. <laughs> it's not pretty. Uh, Reverend uh, Ben Chavis, and he said, and he saw the results originally from the GAO and also from the uh, report by Charles Lee and, and Bernice Miller Travis. Well, this is environmental racism. Nobody liked that term. So negative. And, but they couldn't get away from the facts. We're all lawyers here. We all understand facts. Data. And um, over a period of time, even EPA tried to develop the term environmental equity. Much nicer sounding term. Could not escape the facts. Eventually, what became accepted was the term environmental justice, which we have today. Now, this is the, the tiniest tip of the iceberg. I, there's more to the history, but uh, I could use up the whole two. I was just talking about the history, and there are many other fa factors here. Um, drop on by Howard University's class, and I'll fill you in some more of the history if you get a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
All right, and next we will turn over to O'Day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Errol, and thank you, Quentin, for that really terrific um, opening piece on, on history and context. Uh, I'm going to spend my time really focused on the uh, evolution of legal tools that have been used to achieve environmental justice. You know, as, as, as um, Quentin said earlier, we're really focused here on um, disproportionate impacts to um, especially vulnerable communities, um, people of color and uh, people and, and low income communities. And um, environmental injustice started long, long, long ago, uh, as was described. Um, and in the, in the American legal system, there are a couple of ways in which uh, communities try to deal with environmental injustice early. And I want everybody to have the year of 1994 in their mind, because I'm going to describe how 1994 really expanded the um, legal tools uh, that, that, that can be used uh, to try to achieve environmental justice. Prior to 1994, in the 1980s and 90s especially, um, you see a lot of two uh, types of, of legal um, um, claims being used. One um, is in the framework of tort. And so, you know, I think everybody has heard of various torts. You've got really common ones like nuisance. Um, you've got some less common ones like uh, toxic battery and violation of bodily integrity. But the idea behind torts is that um, you are entitled to enjoy property um, and to enjoy um, uh, to to make sure, to protect your own body. And if somebody is, uh, for example, um, entering your property without your permission, if somebody is striking you without um, uh, consent, uh, these are these are real issues that have been addressed by tort for hundreds of years. Right? We we get our tort system from the English common law. And uh, and we know how to use these uh, tools. And so the question that was um, um, answered in the 1980s and 90s is, can we use these tools to fight environmental injustice? So you can imagine, for example, um, a incredibly toxic landfill next to a community constantly causing terrible odors and uh, and and forcing people to close their windows and forcing people to shut their shades and forcing people to stay inside and not get outdoors. Um, it's in those contexts when it, it seems to make sense to use certain torts like nuisance. In the contemporary context, you see in Flint, Michigan, uh, uh, where there was a terrible lead water crisis, um, you see torts like toxic battery and violation of bodily integrity. The idea that just as if um, you know I punched someone uh, in the face and could get sued for, for battery, uh, the same goes for if I throw poison at them, right? Or if I place poison into their bodies uh, through the water system, uh, there can be a, res a legal response to that. So one kind of legal tool that was used early on uh, to try to achieve environmental justice was the tool of torts and specifically toxic torts. And we can talk in the question and answer session about the details of these kinds of legal claims, the major costs and benefits, although I'll say now that you know, the major cost to a toxic tort action is cost. Um, it, it, it's, it, it takes money to pay attorneys. It takes money to pay experts. Um, thankfully, there are some law firms out there who will take cases on um, and, and get paid out of the, uh, out of the uh, uh, settlement or out of the judgment um, should one be achieved later. Uh, but in any event, so you've got tort frameworks. The other kind of framework that you had early on was the constitutional civil rights framework. And, and so claims from the United States Constitution and similar provisions in state constitutions, um, like the Equal Protection Clause, were used. And the idea behind something like the Equal Protection Clause, to use an example that was given earlier, was why are you only putting landfills and other polluting facilities uh, in or near neighborhoods of color as opposed to other neighborhoods? Why are they not better distributed uh, throughout a particular uh, geography? And so... Um, in order for uh, someone to bring these claims, you have to belong to something called a suspect class. You have to be uh, um, uh, someone who, who deserves a particular protection. And so, for example, you know, uh, an African-American community might bring an equal protection claim uh, against a city or uh, for, for violating their, their equal protection rights. Uh, you know, one example of this that I'll provide just to give some 
some some actual context is there was a city, I believe, in, in Florida um, that was pro, that was sued under equal protection for essentially providing um, a very inequitable distribution of municipal services. Basically, the wealthier white neighborhoods were very well taken care of when it came to sewage treatment and stormwater management and drinking water provision, um, and the black neighborhoods were not. And, um, and that, that was a victory there. But one problem with equal protection claims is that you have to establish um, what we call disparate treatment as opposed to disparate impact. In other words, it's not enough simply to establish uh, that a law that may seem neutral and unbiased on its face uh, produces outcomes uh, that, that clearly affect uh, people of color more than they affect others, that that's not enough, that you have to prove intent. And sometimes you can find that smoking gun email or that smoking gun letter, that overt racism or, or overt bigotry, uh, that explains why the government made a decision to place a landfill somewhere or to behave in a certain way with regard to municipal services. Uh, but often it's going to be a lot more complicated than that. And that has caused these claims to become really difficult um, uh, to achieve victories with. And it's not that there aren't victories and these claims continue to be brought. Uh, but um, certainly one can look at the universe of equal protection claims that have been brought over time in the environmental injustice context and see that um, there are some victories, but unfortunately many, many frustrating losses because of the um, evidentiary burdens that are placed on, on plaintiffs. So then we get to 1994. Now, before and after 1994, you know, we've got torts and we've got uh, civil rights claims like equal protection, uh, like uh, another one that I'll get into, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, but now you've got something new. In 1994, the, uh, President Clinton's administration, uh, as a result of a lot of amazing uh, lobbying and grassroots efforts by environmental justice community groups, um, decided to issue an Executive Order 12898, which was the the, the principle, which is the principal uh, environmental justice executive order that we have at the federal level. And that executive order basically says to federal agencies, you have to take environmental justice seriously. Each federal agency has to have a plan to achieve environmental justice. Um, and then moving forward, you have to implement that plan. So what did that, what new legal tool did that create? Well, that executive order does not create a, something like a private claim or a private cause of action in and of itself. But what it does do is it opens up the brand new legal tool of administrative review. And so we have um, the Administrative Procedures Act and other statutes that regulate the way that agencies make decisions. Um, and the idea is agencies have to make decisions in ways that are not arbitrary and capricious. And one way to establish that an agency is behaving in an arbitrary and capricious way um, is to establish that that agency is violating uh, the presidential executive order that applies to it. Um, and so I just want to give you a few examples of how this plays out in real life. Imagine that the Department of Transportation is considering uh, whether to expand a particular highway. Well, um, although, I, although I will argue that even before the executive order in 1994, this would have been um, uh, necessary, certainly after the 1994 executive order, the Department of Transportation had to consider the impacts to communities of color of that highway expansion. Imagine the Bureau of Land Management considering whether to lease oil and gas resources on federal land that the BLM manages. Well, after 1994, it's very clear that the Bureau of Land Management has to consider the potential impacts to, for example, neighboring um, Indian tribes and sovereign Indian nations uh, who may be impacted by the decision. Um, imagine the National Environmental Policy Act, right, which applies to any major federal action and requires the agency to consider all of the many uh, different environmental impacts. Well, now it's not, it's not enough to say these are the potential environmental impacts of our decisions. Now, under a NEPA review, um, the government has to say, and the, this is how this proposed action will actually impact environmental justice communities. And so we have actually seen environmental justice plaintiffs bring these administrative review actions claiming that agencies are not fulfilling their obligations under the executive order, under their own environmental justice plans, um, um, uh, you know, to, uh, 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 to achieve environmental justice. 
Um, and that executive order works in conjunction with a statute that we have called Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, that statute essentially says thou shalt not discriminate. And it tells federal agencies that when you give money to states and local governments, you have to ensure that they do not discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, etc. And so you have additional administrative review available here. You don't just have the ability to go after federal agencies for not living up to their environmental justice responsibilities. Now what you can do is complain to those federal agencies that the state and local agencies who take their money are not living up to their own environmental justice obligations. So I'll end now, and then I can provide more details in the q and I'll end now by saying that um, the evolution of environmental justice litigation um, is really revolves around 1994. Prior to and after 1994, you always have torts, you always have equal protection claims and similar uh, claims that sound under Title VI. But the big difference is that after 1994, um, the executive order in conjunction with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act really opened up um, the administrative review avenue to, to better achieve environmental justice. Um, admittedly, a lot of that is procedural justice uh, and may not be substantive justice. In other words, you may have to go through better decision making, um, even though we often see you know, negative outcomes come out of even improved uh, you know, decision making processes. Um, but it is certainly a kind of justice uh, and, and, uh, and it certainly has uh, caused agencies to be better behaved. Um, so I think I'll end there, Ariel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jay. It's incredibly helpful. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Carlos. Thank you. I'd love to pass it to Ms. Keys out of respect, but that's okay. Either way, I, I think um, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, we've heard from O'Day how the federal government has shaped a lot of its policy and enforcement uh, and permitting requirements around environmental justice. And I think it's no surprise that uh, as Carlos mentioned earlier, several states are uh, being very aggressive in this space. We, he talked about how New York's uh, Justice 40 initiative became the model by which the Biden administration started its own federal uh, Justice 40 initiatives, with which several uh, government agencies are working through uh, and analyzing how to follow through on the commitments made in that executive order. Uh, but there are several states, about half of the United States are have either enacted environmental justice laws or are considering them. Uh, some notable states, and, and this is important particularly uh, for uh, communities, obviously, but also for uh, those of us that are in the private sector and are advising clients on environmental justice. Uh, it's important to know what the enforcement obligations are, not just from the federal level, but also from the state level. And so, as I said, some of the leaders in this, this area include the state of California, which I think is no surprise to many of us. Uh, they not only have various initiatives uh, and enforcement and permitting uh, requirements, but they also uh, require that a certain percentage of some of the financial planning uh, from their cap and trade program go to disadvantaged communities or communities that are experiencing an undue share of pollution. Uh, Massachusetts is another that is leading in this space. And I think perhaps uh, most notably, or at least most recently, we've seen the state of New Jersey enact an environmental justice law, I wanna say in 2020, and they are in the process now of uh, writing the implementing regulation. I think there's even a, a public hearing later on this evening, if I'm not, uh, if I'm recalling correctly. So it's important uh, to know what state requirements are. There are also uh, tribal considerations. And, and as you think about environmental justice from a tribal perspective, it's also important to uh, recognize the consultation requirements, the sovereignty of uh, the federally recognized tribes. And so that adds an additional layer of obligation for anybody uh, that are, are evaluating EJ issues through that tribal lens. I think it's um, what I have found, and again, I've had the opportunity to, to, to approach environmental justice uh, from both sides of the V, if you will, first uh, as during my tenure uh, with EPA and particularly as a regional administrator where you are working with states, some that are very uh, 
bullish on enforcing environmental laws and some um, that may not be at that same point on the spectrum. And one of the things that we were able to do there is even in the absence of a federal environmental justice law, uh, and there are several that have been introduced in Congress and, and we're certainly hoping uh, that they get to the point of, of actually being enacted. But in the absence of having a federal law, uh, the federal government still has convening power. And so and one of the things that we did as uh, in my regional uh, role was convene our states uh, together and, and actually convene communities with our state representatives. I think we would do one per quarter, we work through all of our eight states and it allowed communities to have a voice, not only with the, the federal family, but also with their state counterparts to make sure that their concerns uh, and needs were voiced and that they could be addressed. The other thing that we did, and again, kind of at that local, quasi-local level, uh, was to replicate the federal interagency working group with our regional counterparts. So while originally, the um, executive order from 1994, I think, had, um, I want to say it was expanded to 17 different agencies, each of whom would have a representative on uh, what was then called uh, the interagency working group. We replicated that model in the region. So we would have our regional counterparts from HUD, from HHS, from DOT, uh, from the Department of Energy working with uh, the EPA regional representatives to be able to again deliver for communities. Obviously, as you talk, whether you're talking about tribal considerations, federal government considerations, state considerations, there are obviously several local governments led by mayors and other uh, local legislative bodies that are focusing on environmental justice. Uh, and that's where it's probably most important because uh, the, that is where you get into. Uh, being able to impact zoning laws. And you heard Professor Payer talk about the intentional racism, the intentional siting of various facilities and, and landfills. All of that was either done pursuant to zoning or led to various zoning laws that were restrictive uh, across the country. And so when you get to the point of being able to address environmental justice at the local level, you really have the opportunity uh, to rezone in a way that can correct or at least prevent further overburden and uh, levels of historic pollution. But obviously all of these regulations, all of these laws, all of these guidance documents, all of these requirements, they are all done for the benefit of, of communities uh, and now that I'm on the other side, representing various companies and facilities, what I found is that there is a spectrum in terms of how industry is looking at uh, environmental justice concerns. You have folks at one end of the spectrum uh, that unfortunately are taking a hot, hard line, either indicating that the company was there first, uh, the community built up around it. They've had various processes and, and policies in place, and they're going to continue to operate in that manner, particularly in the absence of a federal uh, requirement. And these are obviously in states where there is no state environmental justice law. And I think in those situations, what you see is your state and federal re regulators taking a hard line in terms of aggressive enforcement. You've heard uh, Administrator Michael Regan talked about how environmental justice is a priority. Uh, the executive order tasked uh, EPA's enforcement office with exploring the various ways that it can aggressively enforce in, in protection of environmental justice communities. And so I know the acting AA and the nominee, uh, acting AA Larry Starfield uh, and the nominee hope to be confirmed soon. Uh, David Ullman are taking these um, uh, these opportunities very seriously, and so companies need to be prepared for aggressive in enforcement, uh, increased inspections, uh, a greater use of supplemental uh, environmental projects, and those types of things to help provide some sort of redress to uh, these uh, communities in need. 
sort of in the middle place in this spectrum are companies that are curious about environmental justice. They uh, want to do the right thing. They're just curious about how to do it, what the opportunities are. And I think, again, in that space, you can use a combination of both carrots and sticks. And one of the things that Quentin and I are uh, trying to do is highlight some of the success stories of companies that have changed their policies or changed their procedures in a way, built strong relationships with environmental justice communities and are providing uh, a greater level of protection, certainly uh, eliminating some of the ways that they had created issues or problems in the past. And so many companies just simply aren't, aren't aware of what those success stories are. And as we work to socialize them more, we're hoping that we create more momentum towards uh, companies stepping into this space and, and finding ways to be a part of the solution, working with communities, obviously listening to them first, not coming in with a suite of proposed solutions, but actually taking the time to hear from communities, understand their needs, and then work together to uh, to, to come up with some workable options. So that's the middle level. At the high end of the spectrum, you've got companies uh, like Carlos's that have hired internal folks that are focused on environmental justice. They have written environmental justice policies. They have longstanding um, relationships with their communities. Uh, they are looking at environmental justice as part of their larger environmental uh, governance or environmental social governance or ESG portfolio. Uh, and obviously there you've got to, to watch closely in terms of the statements that companies are making in terms of the levels of protections that they are providing, because you don't want to get crossways uh, with the Securities and Exchange Commission, who no doubt will be enforcing a lot of these ESG uh, goals and statements. Uh, you've got third party groups that are looking uh, to ensure that companies are not greenwashing some of their statements that they actually are delivering in the space that, and in the ways that they say that they are. Uh, and so again, as you look at that spectrum from some of the, the worst, uh, and what are perceived as the worst actors to some of those that are doing some really good work in this space, you've got an opportunity from the regulator perspective to use a combination of, of carrots and sticks to, to get companies uh, to do the types of things that would really benefit uh, these communities. And so that's uh, something we can talk about more as we get into the, uh, the, the roundtable discussion. Uh, but I look forward to hearing from her on that. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, well, and first, thank you to Professor Quinton and Ode for that uh, great history lesson and keeping us grounded and decades long work that uh, you all have been um, on to, to get environmental justice to the forefront of policy and um, social discussion. So I appreciate that. And, and uh, thank you to Eli as well. Um, I think, you know, having two incredibly smart women, but two uh, women of color on a panel is amazing as well and something that shouldn't be um, overlooked and understated. I've been on on many manuals, and I've turned down many manuals from uh, that. And I think that that's, I think that that's something that a lot of my corporate partners, I hope, uh, will join me in doing that. But definitely, that's something that should never be. Uh, um, and so, uh, you know, as Ms. Keys um, mentioned, you know, something that I want to focus on is what are corporations doing now to really integrate environmental justice into their business platform or their internal discussions. Um, and something that I think Bloom is um, distinguished um, in the way that we're taking a look at integrating environmental justice um, is really at the learning and outreach uh, portion of, of the intersection of environmental justice and corporations. Or corporations. Um, when I was brought on to Bloom, I think the first question that I really had and one that a lot of corporations are constantly asking themselves is, how, what does it mean to be a good corporate partner? Um, what does it mean to marry corporate goals and um, metrics along with the priorities of the environmental justice movement? Um, and a lot of corporations, uh, private sector companies really kind of get it wrong, right? Um, and, and just going back to the real basic question of what does it mean to be a good friend, to be an ally? I think one that a lot of corporations get wrong is that Friends don't only come to you when they need something or it really only pertains to them, right? Imagine 
uh, a friend who only talks to you about their breakups or their homework or their issues with tests. It's really kind of annoying, right? And <laughs> you're thinking to yourself, like, what am I here for? Am I like, does this person care? Am I just an ear? Am I just someone who's giving them um, kind of my resources and my time? And you expect there to be some kind of relationship, right? And I think there's been a really big disconnect for corporations where they think, you know, we have obviously corporate goals, we have an invested interest to see X, Y, and Z policy. And in our private time, if we happen to have some marrying with environmental justice concerns or priorities or issues, then hopefully we can fulfill those, uh, those priorities and those concerns as well. So, you know, what I've kind of dubbed as the bloom energy equity uh, wheel or circle, and it's constantly, you know, kind of turning. Um, we have four main priority issues about how we hope to uh, interact with environmental justice, energy, uh, and, and just regular community organizations. The first one is learning. Um, the second one is outreach. The third, because I, I work in the policy department, is policy. Uh, and the fourth is partnership, and that's the end goal. So learning, what does that look like? Um, it's creating a repository, doing your research, understanding that not all environmental justice communities, not all communities in America around the world are experiencing the same things. And even if they are experiencing similar things, like let's say you know, uh, wastewater treatment facilities and noxious fumes coming from those or livestock farms, um, and water or air quality issues and negative externalities that come from those operations. Um, but they might have different positions, right? And they might have different opportunities um, to solve those, those issues. And they might have different solutions about what the community wants to do, right? Maybe a community in California that's really dependent on livestock farms doesn't want the livestock farm industry to completely go, uh, go away and to decrease in size. Maybe they just want better regulations or better operations to be able to work within or around um, those those areas. Maybe places in New York City um, want the opposite, right? And I think we have to let each community speak for themselves um, and make sure that we provide them a seat at the table. I think that's the most important thing. Right? Um, the next part after that learning of, hey, what are the different areas that these communities are focused on and what are their priorities? It's outreach, making sure that, um, like Ms. Key said, we have an understanding of what we think you guys um, are saying, but let's make sure. And let's make sure that before we even start to go down this whole long mental exercise of what can we do, that we understand what are the community's plans for themselves already. Um, you know, I'm gonna keep referring to New York City because that's where I worked. And I think that's one of the states in America, like Ms. Key said, really places a high importance on environmental, community and environmental justice community organizations. Um, they have amazing plans, not only for clean energy technology and climate change adaptation, which those frontline and fence lines communities are, as we've seen with COVID, right? They, they feel the, the, the burden and the effects of, of our industrial sectors and um, uh, energy sectors platforms already. Um, but making sure that we're not stepping on anyone's toes and we're not coming in as a corporation saying, we have an idea, we think it's good, you guys should take it no matter what you guys already have um, in place or, or in mind. So making sure that our outreach is good um, and, and taking into account their ideas and their um, desires and their concerns, making sure that we listen, um, making sure that um, we also try to address some of the concerns with some of our own ideas. And at the same time, right, being a good partner. Um, Bloom Energy, we are a energy company, uh, right? We make energy from a fuel cell through mountain combustion. We have electrolyzer, we make hydrogen from water, from natural gas, from a variety of different fuel agnostic. Um, but we're humans, right? And I think everybody wants to work at a corporation that really takes all that stuff into account. So whether it's food sovereignty, whether it's the heat island effect, whether it's water uh, issues, we want to be a good partner and just a good um, person, right? Because I guess now corporations are people, right? Um, we, yeah. <laughs> we want to be a, 
we want to be a, a good person, right, to humanity and to the environmental justice movement. So we're going to hear and we're going to we're going to be here and we're going to support you in all those fights as well, even if it doesn't really pertain to us. And I think that's a really big thing that a lot of corporations aren't understanding is that you've got a responsibility. And I think we all here on this panel and hopefully everybody listening to the end, we're incredibly blessed, right, with the education and with the opportunities that we've been given. Um, and we should all feel a responsibility um, to bear a lot of the action um, that's going to solve a lot of the disparate health or physical um, effects that a lot of these communities have uh, borne um, throughout history, right, centuries. Um, so that's that's our second part outreach. Once we've, we've we've done that, how do we turn the things that we've learned, the relationships and the conversations that we've had, and turn that into policy? And that's really where I think we get the most excited about. Um, you know, Bloom has a long history of of um, helping to write or helping to edit or helping to campaign and push for certain policies around the United States. Um, you know, the most recent ones, uh, the IIJA, the infrastructure bill, um, a lot of that has apprenticeship uh, and living wage requirements, right? Like the bare minimum, making sure that we're uh, tapping into these communities so that they are sustainably, uh, their, their workforce is sustainable, um, that they're able to actually live on the really important work that we're uh, not only needing, but that we're mandating in a lot of cases. Um, and making sure again, right, that whatever we're pushing, um, clean energy technologies, hopefully, um, that those environmental justice communities are the very first in line to reap a lot of those benefits, right? That's what a just transition means, right? We want to make sure that, and, and, and I, you know, I think we all agree, we're going through some kind of a revolution, maybe not as fast, um, you know, as, as I don't think President Obama um, quote, uh, coined this, but I always attribute it to him. History very rarely follows a straight line, but it's almost always going up, right? Um, we want to make sure that those communities that were most affected um, reap those benefits first so that this revolution, this transition um, is not just another transition that we've seen like uh, in the past, but this is a just one um, that as good corporate partners, as good legal partners, as good community partners, that we take accountability for the system that we've all worked in and that we've all profited from, that we've all learned from and in, um, and we really kind of set things straight. So, um, you know, with IIJA, we have the environmental justice provisions in there as well. With the reconciliation bill as well, we have a provision for energy community. So um, whether it's those that were historically um, in uh, coal and natural gas, uh, areas of the United States and where those towns really evolved around those areas, if we're getting rid of them, we can't leave those people behind, right? So making sure that those people as well um, are a part of the solution and giving them really great opportunities to be part of the clean energy revolution and solution workforce, really, really important. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that Bloom is really proud of and, you know, that I've, um, that we have spearheaded and that I've um, taken a lot of time and attention to bring to EPA environmental justice's attention, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council members' attention, Climate Justice Alliance Council members. I've done a lot of outreach, even industry, American Farm Bureau Association, Northeast Residuals and Solids Association, essentially the people that do wastewater and waste. Um, it's the idea around the renewable fuel standard. And the reason why this is so important and timely now um, is because part of that section, um, which was an amendment of the Clean Air Act um, enacted in 2014 was a pathway called the even pathway. So it's how do we take biogas from polluting infrastructure, mainly sited in disadvantaged communities, so livestock farms, uh, wastewater treatment facilities, um, uh, landfills, how do we harness and capture that fugitive methane or noxious gas fumes to decrease the emissions that are we're seeing from those point sources of pollution? convert that gas into electricity for electric vehicle use, which would displace, of course, a lot of polluting infrastructure, right? The Bronx is known as Asthma Valley because of all the transportation uh, vehicles that go through there, five times higher than the rate of anywhere else in New York City. EVs, this, uh, EV integration and displacement of petroleum, one of the, the quickest ways to solve a lot of those issues. Right? And again, going even a step further, all that uh, 
led to a higher COVID mortality rate for that area of New York City because of those pre-existing conditions, right? So just like the environment, everything is interconnected one way or another. It's not just a simple one, two um, issue and solution. Um, but making sure for the very first time when we're looking at the renewable fuel standard, this even pathway that we're expecting to have a noticeable rulemaking this year is again, how do we center equity and environmental justice in these conversations? And I think, you know, Bloom is happy to have played this role, but I think, you know, having led the effort, I'm also very saddened that I'm the one leading it. Um, we proposed the very first environmental justice consideration in the renewable fuel standards history um, to create what we call uh, a disadvantaged community adder. So if you are a polluting infrastructure site, like landfills, agriculture, wastewater treatment facilities in an environmental justice community, disadvantaged community, um, you can get an extra bonus, 10% bonus to the renewable fuel standard. If you capture that, if you decrease the emissions, uh, nitrous oxides, sulfur dioxide, particular matter, uh, methane, right? You should methane emissions from all these uh, processes. Capture that, generate electricity through non-combustion. Um, and again, the combustion of energy is really where you get ozone, interstitial lung disease, um, COPD, uh, infant mortality increase uh, rates. And have that energy be used for electric vehicle um, use in an environmental justice community. Um, that's something that's really novel, we think. And that's something that we've seek a lot of input, a lot of support on, and even the EPA uh, and all of their siloed um, uh, departments no <laughs> um, have agreed that this could be a really interesting idea and one that the Renewable Fuel Standard Department and the program has never had. But again, like, should Bloom Energy and Carlos Garcia be the one to have fought this up and be pushed this? I don't think so, right? I think that a community should have been at the table. That are I mean, frontline and frontline community should have been at the table and, and been the one um, to maybe suggest this or have a better idea. Because I, I definitely, and my girlfriend can tell you, I don't always have the best ideas, right? <laughs> um, but but that's that's part of what we think means being a good corporate partner, right? Is maybe taking the responsibility when those less fortunate don't have a seat at the table, um, when they're not invited to the discussion, making sure that we give them a voice in the context that a corporation can, right? Because Bloom Energy is Bloom Energy. Um, and we understand that it's not always appropriate for a company to have a certain kind of relationship or a certain kind of intermingling with ideas or priorities or whatnot. So that's the battle that we're trying to figure out now and that I'm um, so fortunate to be sitting on a panel like this and being able to learn so much and take that back uh, internally and, and, and disseminate that along with my, my coworkers is, what does it mean to be a good corporate uh, partner in 2022? What does it mean to be a good um, worker and colleague in 2022 in policy and environmental policy? Um, you know, especially when you have such an interesting dynamic with law and Chevron difference, and you know, you know, what does it mean now in this new world that we live in, uh, where equity is at the forefront, but we have so many false solutions at the same time being pushed? Um, how do we kind of navigate this way? And so, yeah, that's that's what we're doing at Bloom, trying to make it all make sense. Thank you so much. So we have heard about how we've got here. We've heard about some of the legal tools used to advance environmental justice through litigation. We've heard about regulatory schemes and the role of businesses and the private sector in advancing environmental justice. And we just heard a case study on a corporation who is working to advance environmental justice through their policies. So now I want to open the discussion up to question and answer from the audience. So um, I will start with the in-person audience. Um, so are there any questions that the audience members have for our panelists today? Not all at once. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, so can you put your hand up? Yes. Um, you both are very much in California and New York. I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the mask, but yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you guys have mentioned California and New York have you know, really been able to um, make great strides in advancing the environmental justice movement. Um, can you talk a little to the difference between doing environmental justice work in 
uh, northern more politically progressive state versus southern politically more conservative states, and what the difference in that would look like? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Or just like specific unique challenges. No, no, no. Great question. Environmental difference. There is no difference between northern states and southern states when it comes to environmental injustices. Okay, you've got some in the north which are just like California, which are outstanding in what they've done in weed mitigation, and you've got uh, you know southern states that are just um, Know, uh, that are doing well. I mean, all, it's just a mixed bag all across the country. Some places are good, some places are not. There is a, uh, there's a survey of environmental justice in the states. The, the last version, that iteration was in 2010, and which was a state by state evaluation by Hastings uh, College of Law. And find some states have absolutely don't even have the word environmental justice in the place. And then, like California, so you have to judge them one at a time. New Jersey just came out with a law, uh, I mean, legislation requiring um, evaluation of and classifications of, of the uh, communities in the states which are underserved, etc. So, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't as uh, say between north and south per se. And I would also add to that it's not well, I think it was mentioned once there is no such thing as an environmental justice law. I don't even think at uh, state level they're, they're, they've got you know they've made the, the, some states have enacted things to address environmental justice issues, but there is no environmental justice law. People have said to me, particularly after uh, the Clinton administration, oh my God, <laughs> all you got is an executive order and all of, with a stroke of a pen, the next president can just wipe it all out. What is it, six, uh, six administ seven administrations later? And environmental justice is still here, okay. And there is going to be an environmental justice law. I don't know when. And I got problems with some of the things in the environmental justice law. But that's not the point. The point is the issues are real. And they are here and they affect business as well as communities. Uh, well, just let me just tag one more thing. I want to thank uh, ELI for this panel. I want to thank the audience for, for, for addressing it. You know, the one thing that's wrong, I just respect the <laughs> Where's the voice of the community in this discussion? I mean, obviously we're all empathetic to the issues. We're all working hard on these issues. And, and I want to point out e e ELI on this because that's not what it's meant to be. I, every panel I go to, and every involvement in it, is always one voice missing. Even at Howard University the School of Law, I got to remind them that we got to get someone from the community because they want to speak with their own voice. And the problem with that is lawyers are not very good at talking to community people, particularly the poor. And even they're not very good at talking about race in environmental justice, but we're supposed to be in the Q and A sessions. Sorry. <laughs> so, other things? Yeah, if I can chime in, yeah. I think uh, uh, Professor Pear is exactly right in that the harm is not different. It happens everywhere in the country. Um, I think, in terms of how you can remedy that harm, there are differences because certainly, if you're in New Jersey, I think those communities may have more wind in their sails to oppose a particular industry permit because the law specifically says, if you don't meet the environmental justice requirements, then your permit and obviously the project is in jeopardy. I think if, if a community is in certain judicial districts or judicial um, jurisdictions 
certain benches, certain courts have held both agencies and companies to account for failing to adhere to uh, whether it's NEPA or other uh, environmental justice based or focused statutes. Um, if you're in where I was the regional administrator, where in certain states you could not say climate change, you could say changing climate, but you could literally in your discussions with state officials, they would not say climate change or other uh, combinations in that order. That's where you have to be creative because you not only have the absence of the law, but you also have um, a, a failure to recognize reality. And so that requires you to be creative and still work to, to make progress, to make positive change. Uh, the challenge is to make sure it's lasting. And to, to Quentin's point, I, I'm thrilled to see that the executive order from 1994, which I guess now is almost 30 years ago, 28 years ago, is still untouched. And, and in fact, that we have a Biden administration and a White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council that has put forth ways to strengthen and improve it in light of that near future. So very interested to see what the next iteration might look like and how the, that may help communities on a broader scale across the country, regardless of what they as opposed to this sort of you could be lucky in one luckier in one place than some of these. Thank you. Um, and Madison, do we have questions from the audience uh, online? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so for one is for local governments with enforcement agencies and legal authority to file civil actions, what are some of the most important issues and or issues to pursue? So can we repeat the question yeah. you said for local yeah. governments who have enforcement authority? Agencies, agencies. and legal authority. Uh, for local governments with enforcement agencies and legal authority to file civil actions, what are some of the most important issues and or industries to pursue? Yeah, so I guess like which, which industry should be prioritized first in terms of regulatory enforcement? I think that's what I'm hearing the question to be. About all of them. <laughs> right. The, uh, thing is that, that they do something. And the most important thing they should be is the trying to survey our audience and try to attract young lawyers, no disrespect to the old lawyers, <laughs> and to come into the field, come to their offices and work on these issues. Um, you know, what's more important than clean air? So, you know, any, any, entity that's working on clean air, we should be not going after them, but we should be helping them, regulating them into a better work. Uh, clean water, you know, everybody in this room, I think, can afford to, to have a bottle of water instead of drinking from the fountain. But imagine if you didn't have that money and if you didn't have clean water, that's, and I go back to my earlier uh, edits of the Declaration of Independence were all entitled to clean water uh, equally. So you can go through the, I mean, industry is not alone. I mean, the government, you know, is look what happened in Flint between uh, EPAs, uh, you know, but more importantly, the state government, what they did, and the municipal government, you know, this is uh, equal. It, in it's an equal inequality opportunity thing that goes across the board. I mean, in taking the mystery out of environmental justice, it's all about equality and equity, which is supposed to be the bedrock of our democracy. Okay, it's, it's, it's really that simple. Are, are you treating me equally? As you do yourself, do unto others as you do unto me. It's that simple. Now, tell you what, I am sick and tired of young white students in my class telling me 
oh, it's not my fault. It was my, my great 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 grandfather. And I'm sick and tired of the black students in the class going, the man got his foot on my neck. Okay, this is a problem that we all have to come together and solve and make the cap quality and the words of the Declaration of Independence meaningful and real. And it only works if we admit it. Instead of, you know, well, which industry should we go into first? You don't want to go after industries because you've got Bloom who's trying to do the right thing. You know, you've got others trying to. How about the, the churches? You know, and he did pick a denomination. Are they doing everything they need? They should be doing for, you know, not just in holy work, but in terms of civil responsibility. Um, schools, you know, we've got schools, you know, now which I mean, teachers are forbidden to use certain words like you suggested right there on other subject areas. But, you know, we are lawyers. We're supposed to take the hard subjects and speak truth to power, and particularly amongst ourselves. So I don't know what more you have to do, but if, you know, if you're an example of what they have got, you've got hope. <laughs> but you know, are they lawyers in, you know, one of our, one of our real comrades, uh, Ben Wilson, who just retired from the senior partner at uh, Beverage and Giant, one of the best environmental litigating firms in this country. You know, basically telling, I mean, part of his portfolio is, is Lecturing, lecturing the world, world, advising his clients. We're talking about Fortune 500, okay? About why environmental justice is part of their bottom line and not charity work, okay? It's not something that you write a check on Sunday and put into the plate and take it, you know, and then you, you know, you bought your way to heaven. This is what to make our democracy work. I'm sorry about my soapbox, but. Uh, it is that important so that um, you can't just think where to start, who, who to go after to uh, you know, make changes with environmental justice. Well, and the, the only thing that I would add to, and it's not a soapbox, I think it's stuff that needs to be said, needs to be heard, is if there is a local agency or a local jurisdiction that has both the resources in terms of agency and personnel, as well as the authorities, that is a great opportunity to partner with the community and find out what their priorities are. And at least then that community begins to feel heard, begins hopefully to develop trust with a government that they feel that they can walk through this with, as opposed to feeling as though they're on their own. So if those resources exist, listen to the folks in your community and get their input and direction as to where those resources should be. And I think I can add a little bit of um, some real world examples as well that we have the, the guidance. And I think it, it ties probably well with the last question as well in terms of what is it like doing business and we're working more of the south, east, west, different parts of the states. Um, and, I, and I echo uh, as well in saying that, like, how can you argue that clean air is more important than clean water, right? Or access to healthcare is less important than uh, energy security, being able to afford that, or uh, childcare. Like, it's, it, it's impossible, right? And that one time you're, almost every time you're going to be wrong or whatever. So, you know, I think. And Bloom, we are very appreciative of all of our partners and all of the state agencies and cities that we work with around the world, and around the United States. We work with conservatives, we work with liberals, we work with senators, governors, state authorities. And I think for the most part, people have an idea now about what is the right thing to do. But they just have different priorities, right? In New York, the CLCPA decarbonized grid 100% by 2050. Um, New Mexico, um, that has 
pretty big amount of jobs and infrastructure on natural gas and oil, they have a different set of priorities, right? Um, they have a different set of constituents that they owe um, a lot of responsibility to, and companies that have invested billions of dollars, workforce, so on and so forth, that they also have a responsibility to, right? Um, but we're all hopefully moving in the right direction of equity and a cleaner system and a more equitable system while we're doing all these things. So, um, you know, I think it's a weird dance that you kind of have to do, um, but I think it, it's just, and I, I'll give an answer that I really hated listening to from professors in college and even on panels, it, it depends, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think case by case. It depends if maybe water in Flint, Michigan is the number one priority that you want to focus on. It depends if in California, if uh, blackouts and forest fires is the number one thing that and, you know, equity and being able to make sure that those communities who can't get out um, have the first right to get out, right? Um, through the help. Like it depends. But I think the best thing that we can do is understanding our moral compass, so to say, mm -hmm. about that we all are on the same page that the people who are the most affected and who have the least ability to help themselves um, should be helped first. Um, but also understanding that don't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? Don't close a conversation out. You know, there are many times uh, in my conversations with congressmen and senators where, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking like, on gay rights issues. Like, I know exactly what you just said on the House floor or the Senate floor, and I really dislike you for it. But there are still maybe the same people or different people in those areas that you represent or in other areas that maybe you have an ability to affect um, that need that clean air, that need that clean water, that need more jobs, that need uh, cheaper uh, energy costs and prices, right? Um, and that's just, the part of doing business. And I think it's up to all of us to choose a corporation, hopefully that you feel good working for and uh, has the right priorities or similar ones that you do. Um, but we have to be realistic in that uh, different states have different laws. You know, talking about enforcement, New York, again, I'm gonna continue to show it. Uh, Article 10 process in New York, um, a local community there that represents um, Sunset Park in uh, Brooklyn called Uprose, um, minority women led, uh, all women, I believe, uh, um, uh, in the organization as well, um, led Article 10. And so if you're familiar with Article 10, I think that we all probably are, um, stipulates in New York a certain energy project um, over a certain size has to go through a public review process. And one of those uh, sections in the review process is environment and community. And so uh, a peaker plant, which is a really old, dirty power plant, uh, was wanting to repurpose uh, itself and say, hey, we're dirty, we know it, we can't even comply with the NOx emission rules that the Department of Conservation in New York set out, but we wanna repurpose it. And we're gonna do something um, in a way that it's gonna be kind of in compliance by 2050, but not really, but we'll get there eventually. Uprose, and I think this speaks as well to what Ms. Keys was talking about, making sure that you, know, you understand what the community's plans are ahead. Um, Uprose said, no, 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 no. Like, not only are you not CLCPA compliant, we already have plans for the community. Pico plans have nothing to do with it. it. Has to do with renewable energy, energy storage, offshore wind that's interconnecting into that same industrial area as well. Um, and, they, and it was a, a story of the Wanus Reef uh, powering project. If anyone was interested in a, a nice, healthy 200, 300 page read. Um, uh, but they won, um, and they rescinded their application for repowering. And you better believe it, uh, and Anija Uppros is a, a member of ours, and we actually shared the same office space. <laughs> um, uh, you better believe that we got really smart people, really great studies to talk about exactly the detrimental effects that that power project, repowering project would have had, um, the historical negative externalities that that power project already had on the community, and the different and really important as well, the different other alternative solutions that that community already had and were already uh, underway. Um, and so that's, I think, you know, that's in New York. You don't have Article 10 in Missouri or Mississippi or Alabama, and I'll stop picking on Southern states, but um, you have to understand that they have different priorities and different laws. And so how do we kind of bring something like 
Article 10 and those ideas that won that case to Missouri, Mississippi, Texas, Alabama, Louisiana. Um, and I love Louisiana, by the way. Um, I was just there talking about a hydrogen hub with the governor. Um, they have really great ideas and equity goals as well, but just different, right? So keep an open mind, keep an open heart, have thick skin, um, but you know, fight for those most marginalized. That should always be your kind of compass. That should always be your motivating factor, apart from all the other kind of noise that media and politicians and corporations want to, uh, to focus on. So I also want to make sure that Oday has the opportunity yes. to yes. chime in. Yes. <laughs> right, that he's not here in person, but I think I saw a hand raise on his screen. Thank you, Gwen. I appreciate that. But just to make sure that we can get as many questions as possible, I think I'll pass for now and let the next questioner go. Thank you, Bill. Um, do we have questions from the in-person I think um, I don't the answer really is politics because that's out of our particular control. We, we can work towards something, but that's up for the American people to, to uh, change Congress to the point that they'll vote for the kind of things that will address, that'll take it seriously. That uh, all we can do is try to lobby the Congress and, and educate them. But you know, you get down to real human things like um, I want to keep my good cushy congressional job and my uh, re retirement plan and health plan, and I'm not going to do anything to uh, look at uh, not to pick on anyone in particular. But sure, why not? A mansion, Senator Mansion in West Virginia. That's one person, whether you agree with them or not, is not my point. It's one person who's able to keep this. At bay now, now apparently if they come to some agreement or, or something downsides, and God bless them all for at least moving the needle. But it's all about politics, and do you have the votes? The biggest problem we have that I don't have to say I say this to communities all the time when they make the mistake of asking me, and that is you've got to get out and vote. Got to get to the poll. I know that they've taken away all of the the boxes, the, the voting boxes and all that they put them on the top of the mountain and, and you've got to, you know, you've got to get out of the boat. That's the only way to change that. But um, it's in the mix. I, I mean, it's, I don't know if that's the answer that you want to hear, but I strongly believe that. Before I gave one, Ode, uh, do you want to respond to this one? No, that's okay. Thank you. You can go ahead. <laughs> So, so, so great question, right? And I, and, and uh, maybe pun intended, it's about putting flyers up, right? Like mm -hmm. sometimes literally, but again, the issues of New York City, very different than the issues of San Francisco, right? Climate change, um, you know, global warming has a lot of different effects. Sea level rise, droughts, um, uh, in Texas, right? Freezes, um, California, dry temperatures in, um, uh, New Mexico uh, aquifers being dried out and then not having any water, right? And then when that uh, uh, when that, when that uh, reservoir dries out, there's a lot of toxic minerals that are in the soil that are going to be exposed to the air. That air is going to be toxic, right? So like that's another one, and that's one that's a fire that's we're kind of kindling, but it's going to come, but we have to put out too. So I think for us. Um, what we have to do is really look at what are the most pressing things that we can, like the professor said, have enough political capital around that we can hopefully move the needle and change people's hearts and minds. Um, 
And I think a big thing, and I think it you know depends on where you fall in the spectrum of neoliberalism, neoenvironmentalism. But at least in America, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, depends on the corporations that are here and here. Um, money makes the world go round, right? Um, you have to ensure that if we have a, an issue, um, that the way that capitalism works, um, we want to make sure that we provide incentives to help solve that issue, right? The federal government, as much as it loves to spend money um, and keep printing money out, can't pay for everything. Uh, and maybe it shouldn't, right? Like that's also a very dangerous precedent that we all always rely on the federal government to provide solutions and not provide any responsibility on communities, state actors, corporations, but making sure that we provide incentives for corporations to want to do the right thing, make it profitable for that, that solution to be um, enacted and, and moved upon. Um, and a lot of that has to do with education, advocacy, getting the political points, having those tough conversations, you know, using incredibly smart uh, uh, professionals like uh, Ms. Keys to help make us uh, have uh, the federal government and the legal ease side uh, on our side as well, and, and make sure that we structure policy and law to enable all those, uh, you know, positive market signals. But you know, the way that America works, it's making sure that corporations, the money is in the right way, flowing the right way. Um, and that hopefully each city, each state has its priorities and understanding about what are the biggest fires that we're gonna have to put out. In New York, it may be flooding, right? And maybe transmission issues, in New York City. Uh, in California, it's obviously wildfires, right? And what it does to the grid, what it does to air quality, what it does to w uh, wildlife. This, we could talk about it for hours, right? This goes on and on about the environment and its negative uh, effects from climate change. But I think that's that's the way I, I look at it. What do you think? I think that's absolutely right. And again, it's, um, I'm happy to see that, that we've at least started. Uh, and if you look at the continuum, again, it's taken us 28 years to get here. If you use the executive order as the starting point, obviously the environmental justice started long before that. But in terms of federal action to drive more federal action, I think you'll see the same sort of benefits from the executive order calling for Justice 40. Hopefully it won't take 28 years for that money to get to communities. I think what I like to see is the hard deadlines within the executive orders by which agencies have to do X, Y, Z. Uh, and now I think particularly as I look at my federal service starting in 2010 under the Obama administration, and those discussions about environmental justice and climate, you're seeing a larger groundswell of support from ordinary citizens. And I think that will help drive the momentum as well because that those are the consumers that are gonna be dictating what companies do. Those are in some instances, the stakeholders and stockholders and board members and others that are gonna be driving change on the corporate level. So it will, change will happen not just from government action, but also because you have these markets. Uh, working at the same time. And I think that's part of the progression. The key is whether it'll be fast enough uh, to pick up momentum such that change can be received, not just in, but received before we get to that. I, I'd like to just piggyback on, on, on one comment. And see, most people don't realize that the Executive Order 12898, Bill Clinton's administration makes high praise for was written by community people and handed to the administration. And they cleaned it up in, in with government ease language and stuff like that. And it was, you know, uh, it kind of compromises all, but it was basically presented to them by the community. And the current one, 14008, has got significant input from the White House Environmental Justice Council. We start off with the Federal Interagency Working Group for Environmental Justice, which was a FACA, a federal advisory committee, damn letters, and that was to advise the administrator of EPA. We finally got it kicked up to the White House, and almost all the people that are on the, uh, the White House uh, uh, advisory committee are all community people. They are all. They are all that they are. Which is a problem for me because I think business needs to be in there. Well, the IWG, you had 
It was the round tables, community, academia, business, you know, government, all that. Now it's just the community people who have needed that kind of leverage, but we cannot solve this problem without business being at the round table. Okay, if you can't, we'll put business over here. We'll tell you what we're, you're going to do when we're finished. It ain't going to work that way. But the driving forces in both these executive orders has been the community. So where is their, you know, where is their voice in meetings like this in, the, in around the country? One of the difficult things that I have found is community lawyers. How do lawyers talk to and listen to communities? Most lawyers are scared to death of poor people, particularly government lawyers, because we all know that they want nothing more than to come in and rifle through the, the treasury, take money and run off someplace. But can you really sit down? I mean, teaching law students how to listen to your client is not easy, for you know, but it's easier teaching them how to listen to your business client because you all kind of talk the same language and think the same logically. But listening to, I was in, down in uh, Louisiana, I don't know, I don't know, in, uh, the, um, uh, no, uh, Cancer Alley. So this little black uh, grandmother with the blue gray hair, you know, basically had her cane and had me up against the wall saying, this is the big time Department of Justice lawyer. When are you going to stop these people from poisoning my children? And she held her grandbaby and all because her daughter died and then the scene. And the only way I was raised, it was probably two answers I had for that. It was even yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am. Guess which coach what I chose. But, you know, I had to know how to talk with this woman. Or as uh, uh, my associate with DOJ uh, took over my responsibility. And hopefully she is going to be the new director of the Department of Justice's offices of environmental justice, which has been announced recently. So I think the first of the ones that HHS now has in the Office of Environmental Justice, and I think transportation. Transportation has a senior leadership team at equity. Looking at equity, okay. And we are all hoping, unless I've missed an announcement, so forgive me if I have, but we're hoping that the transition is So I was telling my replacement, Cynthia, who again replaced me, that she was uh, learning about environmental justice. I said, until Ms. Jones down there in Baton Rouge invites you to sit in our kitchen and have some fried chicken, you are not going to come. And they are not going to trust you. Bedrock of environmental justice is trust, not like trust. You know, and you can't come in there talking about I'm from the federal government, I'm here to help. That ain't going to play. Until they know that you will necessarily will listen to what they have to say, that means sit in her, her kitchen, not in your office. Most young lawyers are not comfortable with that. Oh, they're all looking to be in some big office downtown over in the skyscraper, you know, or on a partnership track, which I applaud. Or oh, they make that money. That's somebody got to pay off those, those student loans sometime. Ago. But for this kind of, of practice, you have to be able to converse with people on their level and in their language about their problems not you or us telling them what's wrong with them. Professor, was, no, I was just going to say, I think the reason that it's hard is because we're in the profession want to share information instead of going in the profession that you need to just sit down and ask questions and get an understanding. And then only after that, and, and it's one of the reasons I, I, I always remember my conversations talked about how he was working as a civil rights advocate, they wouldn't go into the South wearing their suits and, and the, so they put on their overalls. And, and again, it's a, a outward demonstration of a willingness to meet people who they are and listen, not come in all fancy and what have you with a solution. Uh, 
maybe that you have ideas, but those ideas were not going to be viable to really listen and understand what people need. Then you can work together and come to some sort of workable solution. But it, it, what makes it hard is that very often Perhaps we've demonstrated that because we've talked for basically two hours now, but, um, and I'm sure there are more questions. So I apologize for not following the advice that I'm giving. You are a lawyer. First. I am yeah. a lawyer, yes, well, um, I think there's time for one last question um, and we can pull it from um, online. Uh, can you say it again? And we should let Ode go first. I'm yes, sure. yeah. Uh, yeah, so the last question, which I think is a great question, John, is as a young environmental justice advocate and aspiring law student, what is one piece of advice you have with trying to make lasting impact in community? Oday, would you like to start with that one? Sure. Um, I think uh, I would recommend um, something along the lines of what um, uh, Quentin recommended earlier, which is you really have to uh, immerse yourself in the impacted communities. Um, a lot of people approach environmental justice from environmental law and environmental law practitioners by and large, you know, represent medium and large size, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations that are, you know, decently funded or very well funded. Um, and it's a very different uh, ball game. I think that in order to really um, practice environmental justice, you are much better off approaching it from a civil rights and historical uh, perspective. Um, you know, practicing environmental justice, the focus needs to be on justice more than um, environment. And I think that uh, you have to be able you uh, you have to be able to get into communities and to rely on community members as experts. And you have to see those community members as experts in the same way that you would talk to an ecotoxicologist or a, um, you know, a, a, a civil engineer or anyone else as an expert. They are experts in their community. They're experts in the impacts they face, and they're experts in why they're facing those impacts differently than um, uh, than others. Uh, that that community lawyering aspect of environmental justice, I think, is one of the most um, important ones whether you approach it from the um, NGO perspective, government, academia, you know, corporate, I, th I think for the most part across sectors, uh, that will prove true. I'd like to add on top of that, that what you need to do basically is if you're in law school, take an environmental justice uh, seminar or class, and if they don't have it, ask the dean, why not? And if you if they don't have it, see if there's a, a local school that does have it, and get make the dean give you credit for going to that. Go to that class. Uh, if there's an environmental justice clinic somewhere, take part in that. Find in the community. There's somewhere nearby. There's a uh, there are there's an environmental justice advocate of some sort, and go to their meetings and learn how to talk with them and to be identified. Once you are identified with someone, oh, they actually care. They're just not showing up in court. Well, that's the only time I see them, but they're actually sitting down in my, my living room talking to me. You develop the trust and the reputation amongst them. And that's how this works in environmental justice. You know, oh, yeah, I know uh, Professor Pear. I work with him. It's not that he's a nice guy, right? It's that he listens. Um, but I think that, that those are would be, uh, you know, oh, the last thing is, one of the things we have found in uh, our class at, uh, at Howard is we, we require our students as part of the course to every week have to turn in or be prepared to, they have to turn in an article they have found in current media on what they think is environmental justice and come to class and defend it and get beat up as to why that's not a good article on environmental justice. <laughs> and they all start off with, oh my God, you know, but uh, I and I, you know, over the years, have gone back and asked students, said, look, this is a little too much. And we just, you know, and you know, without exception, have all said this was one of the best learning tools because it focuses on the, on what the real meaning of environmental justice is. And for the professors to get an idea if this particular student really has gotten a grasp or has learned something about what environmental justice is. So I would encourage you 
an exercise like looking in the media for an environmental justice issue of the day. Like either of our other panelists to answer that. You know, I, I wrote down study, observe, and look for connection. So study the law, but obviously study the community, much the way uh, Quentin suggested. Um, and study the agencies, like understand where the resources are, where the opportunities are. I used to have a saying in the region that we were looking for the unusual suspects, the, the places where partnership didn't seem obvious, uh, but really could create some synergies. Obviously, observe, observe your community, observe those around you, be self-aware enough to know when you're talking too much, perhaps like I am now, uh, and, and when you need to just be quiet and listen, and then look for those connections, build those partnerships, and bring resources that folks uh, may not normally uh, be exposed to in their circles. Yeah. I and I think this echoes, you know, a lot of what everyone has said in uh, closing remarks, but what I always say about the environmental justice movement, and Professor Quinn spoke about it as well, is that understand that now the movement moves at the speed of trust. And so, you know, understand, do the research, understand why certain communities, organizations feel the way they do around people in suits or corporations coming and telling you I've got the next best thing since uh, sliced bread or this is going to take away all of your problems. Anybody tells you that, right? Because that's what it feels. Understand that there's a lot of history, centuries old history behind this stuff. And so you have to kind of come at this from a place of how do I build trust? How do I be a good friend, right? It goes back to that question that Boom trying to answer. How do we change the narrative around corporations and organizations around policy and communities it all begins with trust so when you look at it through that lens have that moral compass i talked to you about about equity always being at the forefront about what you do or the conversations you're having or the conversations you're not having um know that the movement moves at the future trust thank you well said. And with that, I want to thank each of our panelists for contributing to this wonderful discussion today and thank everyone who attended today's session. Um, if you have any follow up questions or want to learn more about environmental justice, we have resources at ELI and we will be able to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, I think you, yeah.